My name is Kathleen Voss. I am a professor at the University of Minnesota. I'm a social psychologist who works in the business school. I work in the marketing department. And today, my lecture will be on the topic of heterosexual sexual relationships. So, imagine that you sat down one morning to breakfast and you opened up your newspaper or you clicked on your favorite news browser and you read that officials in the UK let a group of foreigners settle without proper immigration checks. Okay. Now imagine further that you read that the group of foreigners was a group of women and even further that this was a group of highly attractive women. The story ended by noting that there may or may not have been sex between the immigration officers and the foreign women. Now, a few days later, you read in the newspaper something again about sex. In this case, it's a Viennese shopping mall, and they're offering women a special promotion. Women who agree, not just agree, but women who come to the shopping mall topless receive a bottle of champagne, a free meal, and a shopping voucher worth 40 euros. This campaign was a huge success, by the way. And very last, imagine back to your history days when you learned that Australia was a penal colony. So back then, this was in the 1800s, the severest punishment for infractions was to have a public whipping. Now, female prisoners were given an option that male prisoners were not their whippings would be cut in half if they agreed to take them naked, presumably to please the male onlookers. What do these stories have in common? They have in common the idea that sex is something that women have and, and seem to own or possess in a sense, and that men are willing to trade resources to obtain that sex in some way, shape, or form. So the resources can be um, living in a safe country, it can be mon monetary, money resources, or it can be the lessening of a very, very harsh punishment. The lecture today will be about this very idea that sex is a female resource and that men are willing to trade resources that they possess or have access to in order to gain sexual access to women. It is called sexual economics, and it's probably the most unromantic theory about sex you'll ever have learned, but in it, uh, we're able to describe and predict people's behaviors on the basis of fundamental, basic economic principles. So, let me tell you a little bit more about the core ideas. The core ideas of sexual economic theory are that countries, cultures, and individuals treat female sexuality as if it has value and is precious. Male sexuality, however, has no value or worth. Women own sex, that is, it is theirs to decide when uh, sex occurs, with whom, why, and how. And men, conversely, uh, enter into a sexual interaction with uh, other resources, and they're seeking to trade them with women for access to them sexually. Now, these resources can be monetary, but they can also be things like rights, like voting rights, or land. They can be emotional, such as caring and being kind to them or affectionate, and they can be relationship-oriented resources as well, such as commitment, devotion, marriage, and last, even children, the agreement that this relationship can bear children. In the sexual economic theory, it's understood that a high price of sex, which is to say the amount or the costliness or the um, preciousness of the resources that men give, that the price of sex uh, when it's high, that favors women, and men would like the price of sex to be low. So women's goals are often to obtain resources, as many as possible, before sex will commence. And men's goal will be to obtain sex without having to give many resources. It, what are we talking about when we talk about sex in this theory? Well, the idea of sex is broader than simply the act of sexual intercourse. Sex can be talking about sex. Sex can include being near an attractive woman or a sexual woman. Sex can include um, viewing or finding sexual imagery appealing. And this includes acts with a variety of sexual overtones, such as dating, flirting, touching, fondling, and also, of course, sexual intercourse. So how do we know that sex is a female resource? 
Well, there are several experiments that pinpoint this idea that women are the gatekeepers of sex. So one telling study asked men and women in dating relationships, at what number of dates do you think it's appropriate for men and women to first have sex? In case you're wondering, men on average think that the number of dates should be half as many as women. <laughs> And then more importantly for this idea that uh, women own sex and decide when sex occurs in a relationship, the researchers then further asked these men and women, when in your dating relationships did sex take place? And what they find is that men's preferences or ideas about what number date sex should first take place on bore no relationship to when they were having sex in their relationships. But women's preferences and ideas about when sex should first take place in a relationship were almost perfectly correlated with when men and women actually had sex in those relationships. So this underscores this idea that women are the gatekeepers of sex. They decide when, how, and why sex occurs. We come to understand the idea that women have more negotiating power when it comes to sex as stemming from a basic underlying difference between men and women's desire to have sex. So in a paper that my colleagues and I published in early 2000s, we investigated whether men or women want sex more. And it may not sound like a very interesting or surprising question, but in fact, the literature was quite divided. When we looked at various textbooks about sexuality, some of them said, well, of course, men want sex more than women. But others said, women want sex more than men. And still yet others said the question should not even be asked. We decided to do an investigation into the science. We wanted to read all scientific articles on men and women's sexual preferences, emotions, ideas, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. And so we did that. We read over 250 articles about men and women's sexual desires and behaviors. And we broke the research down into 12 different categories of indicators of sexual motivation. So things like um, how, frequency, how frequently people have sexual fantasies, uh, the desired number of sexual partners, the liking for a variety of sexual practices, and uh, the amount of masturbation that people engage in. And across all 12 categories, we found overwhelming evidence that men want sex more than women. Perhaps not surprising to some, but again, that was an important step for us uh, in this investigation of sexual economics. And so when we now understand that men want sex more than women, we can better understand how men and women enter into a sexual relationship, or rather a relationship that may turn sexual. So now understanding that on average, when a man and a woman come together in a relationship that may turn sexual, he, on average, will want sex more than she does. This means that she has more negotiating power in order to request or demand other types of resources before sex will take place. There's a theory called um, the principle of least interest, and in it, it states that whenever two parties come together to have a negotiation, the party that is interested in the outcome the least has the most power. So if you've ever been in love with someone, and you love that person more than that person loves you, you felt this, that you would do more things, you would sacrifice more than would the other person. And so when men and women enter into a sexual negotiation, because men in general will want sex more than women, women then can ask for other resources in exchange before sex will take place. Now, the sexual economics theory is backed up by a variety of research. Like in the other paper I described, we read over 200 scholarly articles about how men and women think about sex and whether we could understand sex as a female resource that men trade other resources to obtain. We reviewed scholarly research from anthropology, sociology, clinical psychology, demography, medicine, health, history, and the like. And we were overwhelmed by the amount of evidence that we were able to obtain in support of a sexual economics theory. So let me tell you a few pieces of information and then some experiments that my lab conducted. And one piece of information that helps us understand sexual economics are conditions in which there are differences, discrepancies, in the number of men and women there are in a local environment. 
And so um, if we understand women as owning sex and men wanting sex, this is going to be a very crude analogy, but because we're talking about an economic model, we can understand women as in a sense being sellers and men in a sense being buyers. So uh, there are studies of what happens in a local environment when there are more women to men or more when, men to women. And so in one of these studies, the researchers found in a historical analysis of women's clothing that when there were many, many, many more men in a local environment compared to women, this means that women have even more negotiating power than they would otherwise. And in the clothing analysis, they found that skirt lengths, women's skirt lengths, were the longest in conditions in which there were many more men in a local environment compared to women. Now, the converse happened as well. In local environments across history, when there would be more women in the environment than men, skirt lengths rose so that the skirts were shorter. And we understood this in our theory as um, the way that women dress and the way that their skirts rise and fall might represent something like advertising. That when women's sexuality is their, again, this is very crude, but is their product, then they need to advertise their product in some ways. And wearing alluring clothing is one way for women to uh, seem more sexual. And that need would arise when women are competing with other women more so than when there are fewer women to compete with. So that means in conditions in which there are lots of women and very few men, women dress more sexily. And when there are many more men than women in an environment, women didn't have to dress very sexy and they kept their skirt lengths long. Uh, other research supports this idea that men and women trade sex and other types of resources. So in one paper that asked men and women what most annoys or irritates them about dating relationships with the opposite sex, they found evidence in support of sexual economics theory. So women reported that the most irritating thing about dating a man is when a man offers relationship promises before the couple has sex. And once the couple has sex, he is nowhere to be found and the relationship does not ensue. Men have a different complaint. Men complain that when they court a woman for a very long time and shower her with gifts and dinners and other kinds of monetary or even affectionate resources, and then the relationship never turns sexual. So in both of these cases, we see that a resource was given up by one gender and there was an expectation that the other resource would come in and be traded for it, but then that expectation then was not met. These uh, irritations about courtship also support the idea of sexual economics and sex as a female and tradable resource. Now, we move to some experiments in my lab to try to better understand sexual economics and, uh, and in particular, how we can understand women's reactions to, to the idea of sex. So in these experiments, what we have men and women doing is we have them viewing sexual imagery and we use their reactions to sexual imagery as a proxy for how they feel about sex in general. So the general setup of these experiments is that subjects come into the lab and they sit down and they view a series of print advertisements. And the key advertisement is one for a watch. And that watch is either promoted by an ad that features a highly sexual scene or an ad that features a non-sexual scene. In this scene, we have um, of, um, a picture of mountains, actually. We have our subjects coming in and looking at these and then giving us their spontaneous reactions to the ads. And we have them doing that by, um, when they're viewing the ads, they rehearse a 10-digit number in their heads. Why do we do this? Because previous research has shown that when you get men and women to be distracted with another task, their spontaneous gut reactions to the environment can come out more. And we're interested in men and women's spontaneous, impulsive reactions to sexual imagery. So in the first experiment, our subjects come into the lab and they start rehearsing that 10-digit number. Now we have them looking through a booklet with print advertisements, one of which then shows that watch that I mentioned, either being advertised in a sexual scene or in a mountainscape scene. And the part that makes uh, this study having to do with sexual economics is 
We then further varied the ads by one other dimension. Some participants saw the ad for the watch and it was plain. Nothing about it was uh, particularly different. It was either situated in a sexual scene or a mountain scene. But other participants saw the ads and they saw the watch being draped by a red ribbon. And underneath the ad, we'd written the tagline, this is a watch that men will give to the special woman in their lives. So in these conditions, we hope to bring up the idea of a resource transfer from men to women. And in this way, we thought that we could um, get women to view the sexual ads as being more appealing than they would otherwise. So what we know from previous research is that women don't generally like sexual ads. They view them as uh, unfavorable, unlikable, crass, crude, and so on. And so our goal with this experiment was to see if we could get women to think about a sexual ad or sexual imagery as representing resource transfer between a man and a woman, maybe women would like the sexual imagery more. So our prediction was that when women saw a sexual ad and that sexual ad reminded them of gifts that men give to special women in their lives, they would like the sexual ad more than if the sexual ad had no reminders of gifts being given from men to women. And that is exactly what we found. We found that when women saw a sexual ad compared to a mountain ad, they didn't like the sexual ad very much. They thought it was relatively unfavorable, unlikable, and so on. But when women saw a sexual ad that was paired with the understanding that the product in the ad could be used by a man to honor the special woman in his life, then they liked the sexual ad much more. And in fact, it came statistically equivalent to their feelings about the non-sexual ad. So this was quite remarkable because in general, women take a hard stance against sexual imagery and they tend not to like it. And this was uh, a novel finding that we could make women appreciate sexual imagery more because of this reminder of resource transfer. Now, in the second experiment we conducted, we wanted to understand several new things. One, we wanted to shift the idea of resource transfer away from something that was monetary and you know, physical, like a gift, and move it to something that, especially modern women, are interested in receiving, emotional and relational resources. And so in study two, we connected the idea of resource transfers from men to women in an emotional, relational way. And I'll tell you in a minute how we did that. The second thing we did in experiment two that was different from experiment one is we not only measured how women felt about the sexual imagery, we also measured their mood. Because our hypothesis was is that sexual imagery, when it's used without mentions of resource transfer, makes women upset and angry. But that when resource transfer is involved in the sexual imagery, that that would soften women's negative mood. And so in this experiment, uh, we have women coming into the lab and the first thing they do for us is they do a proofreading task. In a proofreading task, their job is to read a paragraph of text and to find if we have misspellings or grammar errors in the text. This task is one where we uh, are able then to get women exposed to different types of information. And in this experiment, we have them reading text that refers to one of three themes. We have a loyalty prime. And in a lo the loyalty prime condition, our participants were reading about a man and a woman who are a couple, and the man is extremely loyal to the woman. So for example, it would read things like, John and Mary are young and have a lot going for them. Their friends notice how completely devoted John is to Mary, and how he used to lead a bachelor lifestyle, but that all has changed. We also, in another condition, had subjects reading about a disloyalty prime. And in this proofreading task, our subjects also read about John and Mary, who are also a young couple with a lot going for them. But in this condition, our subjects also read that all their friends notice that John is not completely devoted to Mary, and that John used to lead a bachelor lifestyle, and that not, has not really changed. So now they're thinking about men not being very loyal to women, and not transferring those emotional and uh, relational resources. And in a third aspect of this proofreading task, we also have our subjects reading about John and Mary, but now John and Mary are students at the university who are both involved with um, 
the university organization, the Student Senate. So they read about the two of them working on activities together. After one of these three proofreading tasks, now we have our subjects uh, looking at the sexual imagery or the mountain imagery, again in a way to view a product. And our prediction was that when women are reminded of a lack of resource transfer from men to women, so the disloyalty prime condition, they would view the sexual imagery in a very negative fashion. But when women read about the loyalty prime and that activated for them the idea of emotional and relational resources being transferred from men to women, that they would like the sexual ad more and they would find it more appealing. And that is what we found. So women's reactions to the sexual imagery were predicted by whether we reminded them of a loyal relationship partner, a disloyal relationship partner, or a neutral relationship. We found that reactions to the ad were most negative when women were reminded of a disloyal partner, but reactions to the sexual ad were more positive when women were reminded of a loyal partner, again stimulating that idea of emotional and relational resources from men to women. And reactions to the sexual ad fell in between for our participants who read about John and Mary being in the Student Senate. Furthermore, I told you that we tested mood. And our idea was that when women read about a sexual ad that doesn't include resource transfer, that makes them angry. And that is what we found, that women were the most upset about the ad and they registered the highest degree of negative emotions when they saw a sexual imagery scene that was preceded by a reminder of men not being loyal to women. But when women read about men being loyal to women, Seeing the sexual imagery didn't make them all that upset and their negative emotions were lower. So we found evidence for the idea that women like the uh, concept of resource transfer from men to women and that when that idea of transfer is broken in the, like the disloyalty condition that they get quite upset and they have a negative reaction to the idea of sex. So in conclusion, the lecture today has made several points. One is that female sexuality is treated as if it has value and is precious and has a price, so to speak, and hence sex is a female resource. Male sexuality, conversely, has no such value. Countries, cultures, and individuals do not treat male sexuality as if it is precious or can be traded for a price. There is a sexual marketplace that exists that link couples together, uh, whereas where women can trade sex for other resources that men might give them. These might be gifts or money or rights or relationship commitment or affection or children. And last, data from my own lab has shown that linking resource transfers, so the idea of men giving women resources, possibly a gift, possibly relationship loyalty, that makes the idea of sex seem more appealing to women.